2021. I wasn't bit present. Welcome to the start of the ITB 2024 quantitative trading course. It's lecture zero. Uh, this is going to be about Python fundamentals to help you for the rest of the course. Uh, and before we begin, we'd like to make a quick announcement. So let me hand you over to our head of technology, Krish. Yeah, hi guys, um, I'm Krish. I'm your head of tech this year. Uh, so essentially what I want to talk to you about today is um, upon the end of, of um, this series, we will be looking for three junior devs to join us. Um, the project will involve something similar to a market trading analysis tool. And um, it's good, a potential benefit is that um, you will secure equity in the very project you'll be working on. Uh, and um, it's essentially the software you write will benefit you. So yeah, if you have any questions, come to us at the end, but this you'll hear more information about this in the coming weeks. Cool, and now I'll hand you over to the lead lecturer for this series, which is Ahmed Dinesh. Thank you very much. So, unfortunately, my clicker doesn't work, so I'm going to have to compensate by sit standing here for most of my time. But thank you very much. So, welcome to Quantitative Trading. This is the second year that this course is being run. Um, we've done this uh, previously, it went very well, and this year we're kind of building upon that to make it even better. So, I'm going to be taking lecture zero, which is an introduction to Python, um, so I won't take any, I won't waste much more before to, to try and introduce it, so I'll get going straight away. So this is the lecture structure, I think you can read for yourself, we'll start with Python, then we'll build upon that, start looking at data science, which is a pandas, then we'll build upon that even more by looking at APIs, how to interface with, with uh, services that are online, and then looking at algorithmic trading. Then we're going to look at market making, which is actually a lecture that I did very well, and then looking at decentralized finance, which is a crypto element, and I'll finish off with risk management before we start opening up the applications as Krish mentioned for the internal projects, which as Krish mentions as well, you also for the first time is also have some of your own equity. So if we actually launch the project, get it going, and hopefully if it's a money maker, you'll have some uh, money to move there as well. But that's another time. Uh, there are Amazon codes and pizza available. So if you spot an Amazon code, please, well, if you want, uh, type it as quickly as you can into the redeem section of Amazon, and um, you'll get the code. You'll get the code, and you get the money. To actually follow along as well, there is a, um, as I'll show you in a moment, there is a GitHub. There is two notebooks. Uh, this is a notebook that I wrote last year, and it was it was it went around the un university quite well. So a lot of people use this to learn uh, Python. There's also um, one that will send at the end of the. Uh, lecture course, which is just the code that I've written today for you guys to have a look at. That's um, where's it gone? It's somewhere here. Um, so this is the code that we're going to write, and I'll we'll um, share that out later on as well. Um, but I'm going to do it on a blank canvas. Uh, let's hope that will work. So if I do print hello world and then run it, just connecting for a bit. Right, it doesn't break down and um, that obviously all works so you're all good to go but there's also a backup there as well so we're all well informed right let's not waste any more time um, as i said i'll leave that on there for 30 seconds so it's time from now uh, this is where you can find all the codes so if you want to scan the qr code or type the um, link into the chat it does say 2023 please don't hesitate it's literally the same thing um, the slides have been just slightly updated and the structure has been slightly reorientated to make your learning experience slightly more enjoyable. Um, so another 15 seconds, I've got a watch, so it's going to be keeping track of time. And that way we don't waste everyone's evening and you have a productive evening at the same time. Checking that. Yeah, good on that front. So I'm going to give you. I can take this out. Anyhow, um, I assume this will disappear at some moment, but we'll leave that for now. So it does say there, um, why may programming be beneficial? So the question is, why would we want to program in the first place? 
So the, pretty much the reason why we do programming is just to get the computer to do mundane tasks that we as humans might be too slow at, but might be very inaccurate at. It does tend to give better accuracy than humans, uh, human beings like ourselves, but that's not always guaranteed. Um, it does also help us to solve certain complex problems. And for example, in mathematics, if you're solving a, a partial differential equation or certain orders of differential equations, that's why we use computers because we can't look at it. We can't look at the equation and then solve it using algebra, which is otherwise known as analytically solving for it. It also helps us to interact with other machines on the internet, which you'll also see in lecture three. And it also can be quite a lot quicker than we can as human beings because solid state hardware is always much faster. And that's very important in quantitative trading. And in addition, it's also very fun as a problem solving exercise once you are taught very well. So just before we actually launch into some code, it's probably a good idea to understand how computers work. So computers don't work, they don't think in English or they're not sentient at the moment. They actually think in something called machine code, hence machine. Uh, and they're essentially the raw instructions that a computer uses in order to process the instructions that it does. So if you look at this one, for example, this is a very simple hello world and it's been extracted from a 32 byte Linux system. Linux is just an operating system, much the same way you've got Windows, but this is how it's done. So you can see on the very far right, you've got the output here, um, which is how it processes its own instructions. And if you want, there's the external link there for you to look at in your own time from Stack Overflow, which is where I got this information from. If we're looking at it more internally in terms of how the computer actually looks, we start by looking at the machine code. And the machine code essentially will pass its instructions to the heart of the computer, which is called the central processing unit. It's responsible for pretty much everything that the computer does, hence central. Um, the problem is machine code, as you just saw, isn't very human friendly. It would take us forever to write a proper program. It only took us around eight lines just to get Hello World out in binary. So the question really was in the 1940s and the 1950s was how can we get humans to actually interact with computers in a much more understandable manner? And the other answer to that was by looking at higher level programming languages, and I'll show what that means higher, uh, what higher means rather, um, through the use of co programming languages such as Python that we use nowadays. The founder of Python was a Dutch gentleman called Frieda van Rossum. I hope I said that right. And essentially his objective was to make Python very accessible. So he started to envisualize what we call an architecture, just a general plan, by looking at the high level code that we would write. So that's human readable code. That's very far from the machine's in, un, interpretation. And then what well, the first thing that he would do, uh, the, the, the program does rather, and that he designed, was to check that the program is error free. This is otherwise known as compiling the program, so as I putting it together. I do want to stress that this is a gross simplification, but it will benefit you now. Once it's been checked so that it's error free, then it starts to work into converting that program into something that the computer slightly understands a bit better called bytecode. After that, it's passed through something called a virtual machine, which is just essentially a program that converts, translates the bytecode into machine code in the same way that if you were speaking to someone from another country, you maybe have an interpreter in the middle. That's the same thing that the virtual machine does. It interprets language that's foreign to it to something that it understands very well for the CPU. And then it, get, it, it spits out machine code and that's what the CPU then uses, as I mentioned very briefly previously. And the work by the interpreter covers everything from the compiler to the machine code, um, which is essentially what you're going to be using later on. In order to make ourselves very uh, beneficial, in order to benefit the most from, from the art of programming, we're going to be using a couple of tools. Uh, these tools include the editor, which is basically like a uh, space where you can type things in. It's a bit like Microsoft Word, but for programming. Uh, or a Google Doc, as I've mentioned. Uh, we have something more to that. We have we built something around the editor called the Integrated Development Environment. It's otherwise known as an IDE, and it has certain tools. In some way, same way that Microsoft Word has a spell checker, the IDE has certain tools, such as the compiler as well, in addition to the editor and other various tools. What we're actually doing with the computer is that we're speaking to the computer and giving it instructions for it to complete. Of course, we can't just walk right into the heart of the computer because that will be a security risk. So the computer is actually wrapped in something called a shell. If you think about the Earth has a set as a core and it's wrapped in a shell, so is the same with a computer, which is where the word comes from. And the shell actually is an intermediary to help make sure that it communicates well uh, with the operating system. But we'll talk about the shell a bit later on. Uh, in terms of what you need to install on your computer, and we'd assume you have this to hand, uh, you'd have a very good IDE. Uh, the best one to use is Microsoft Visual Studio Code, which is available on Windows and Mac. Uh, but you also have to make sure your Python is up to date. You can also use Jupyter Notebook, which is a slightly more uh, better alternative. But when we're 
looking to develop things, uh, especially programs, we prefer to use an IDE, which is much more advanced. Now, before we actually start writing our first line of code, it's a good point to also just mention something which are called functions. We'll come back to this later on. In um, functions essentially derive themselves from mathematics because maths was actually a fundamental building block for computer science. Maths uh, essentially says that if we have a function, which you may be aware of, we take an input value and we return an output value. So we something gets processed in and something gets spit out or out outputted. Good example here, if we give the if we have a number, which a three, and we push it through a function, uh, f of three gives us the result of nine. The input is otherwise known as the value of three, which we call the argument. And the one number that we get out is called the output, which is otherwise known as the return value. If we generalize this in a sort of schematic to see what the function is doing, it's essentially taking the input, which is x, and it's returning x squared. So as I mentioned, our input value is called the argument of the function, and the output is called the return value of the function. And Python also allows us to actually build more stuff that doesn't just involve numbers, also for our own functions, which are called user-defined, because we are the user. And that works with more than just numbers, it works with all different types of data. So the first thing that we're going to do, as you've just seen in a few seconds ago, is we're going to try and work with communicating with the computer. Uh, so we start here, and as you just saw, I'm just going to remove this bit of line here. We're going to start by doing something called a print statement. A print statement is the simplest form of a function. All you do is you have write print, which is the keyword of the function. You put it around brackets, just like you would in a mathematical function, and you put you input the phrase hello world. If I just put the cursor to the side there, yep. And then all that happens is that we give the computer the phrase hello world, and output is something that it just prints for us. If I press Control Enter, it'll take some time, and that's the output there. And that's generally the fundamental idea of any function, especially with the print function. We give it something, and it gives us out something. If I would just return to the slides and we analyze that very quickly and very efficiently. That's, this is what we receive as the output. So this was actually an I, uh, a hello world was actually just a phrase that was attributed to a computer scientist called Brian Kernahan, who is a computer scientist, and he was actually responsible for the very first language, very first types of languages called B. If you know the language C or C++, this was the precursor, and he founded it while he was at Bell Labs in around 1974 which is the earliest attribution that I could find. There is an Amazon code there, so if you want to run away and process that, please do. In the meantime, I shall carry on with my conversation. If we look at the slide in a bit more detail, we have, as I said, a function which has a keyword, and we've given it a set of letters for it to process. It's otherwise known as a string. A string is essentially just a collection of characters, A to Z, 0 to 9, which are basically just strung together to just make a sentence or a certain phrase, and we surround it with quotation marks. In this case, I've done double quotation marks, but single quotation marks are also acceptable. Now, functions, uh, as you'll figure out with the rest of your programming experience, are what we call case sensitive. The spelling is very important. They're also syntax specific. They have to be written in a certain order. So, for example, using a capital P is unacceptable. Uh, the computer will not allow you to do that. It has to be lowercase p. In addition to that, we also have the uh, mistake that often people make is where they put the brackets inside of the quotation marks. That's also unacceptable because the function has to have the input inside of the brackets. So strings must be inside the brackets. In the same way that you might be aware of, for example, grammar in English, the programming's equivalent is called syntax. In fact, we do say lexical syntax, but that's a very uh, uh, academic term. We just say grammar, but the words are interchangeable. We can actually help develop this a bit more um, we, by actually saving some of our input data into a little box or a little space in memory in our computer, which is what we call a variable. So if we look at this, for example, just before we actually launch into our IDE, what we've got is our message here, our string, as I said, it's called Imperial Blockchain Group, and we save it to a variable which is called message. And um, we do message equals, this is Imperial Blockchain Group, which is a string. And all we're doing is we're just printing that string. No surprise, well, that was gonna say this is Imperial Blockchain Group. Unfortunately, I did a copy and paste job, but it would say this is Imperial Blockchain Group as itself. Um, no, never mind. Variables do store information in the computer memory for later use. So we store the variable and then we can use it as many times as we want. The way I like to think about it, if this was a box, um, that had a hello world in it, which is relevant to the shell window that I've shown you. 
all I'm doing with the variable name was I'm sticking a little um, sticky note on it and just saying this is what it's called and this is what it will be referred to and it's called message in this case. Creating the variable is otherwise known as initialization. The reason I say that is because you'll sometimes come across the word decla variable declaration and that's completely different. It's not something that exists in Python, so don't fuss yourself about it. Um, just to make sure that I am on the right track, I am indeed. So we're just going to go over. It's very simple. Uh, I believe it's this one here. Yep. So in um, Colab, all I do is I do message equals, and I'm just going to type this very quickly, imperial blockchain group. And then we print message. And unlike the slide, which had a copy and paste classic error, this will print imperial blockchain group. It's very simple, very straightforward. Now, I'm just going to carry on with that. Obviously, I changed the name now to my string, so it's the same concept. But in terms of naming your variables, we do like to make sure there's always a consistency in how you name them. We don't want to say one or two words, or we also don't want the, the name of the variable to be 20 words long. It's got to be concise, because remember, someone else is going to be reading this potentially five or 10 years down the line. So please do be sensible with what you name your variables, because other programmers will read them as well. You cannot start a variable name with a number that is not allowed um, so don't try. Well, you, you can try it, but it will give you an error. The best way that we recommend uh, doing variable names is to use camel case. Uh, so, for example, the first letter, the, the, the first word, my, has a lower case to start with, lowercase m, and then the second word string is uppercase uh, s. If you think about a camel, it's got a few humps. So if you think about it, that's sort of how it looks there as well. So my string is sort of a bit like a hump. Everything okay? We ordered the pizza in. They don't have any like dietary requirements, like vegan, gluten, right? Okay. Fantastic. Um, likewise as well, you can also capitalize the first letter. I prefer to capitalize the, um, I prefer to put the first letter as lowercase. I hope that's all good so far. Any nodding looks very good. So I believe we'll carry on. Any, any questions, please do let me know. So now that we've covered how variables work, now we can look at different types of variables. We don't just look at numbers, we can also look at different types of data. Um, the different types of data that are available to you range from string to integers, which you're aware of from mathematics, floats, which are just a programmer's way of calling a decimal, and Boolean. So a string, as I mentioned, just a string of characters, it includes A to Z, that's alphanumeric, lowercase, uppercase, and zero to nine. Um, also some... Um, punctuation, but that's uh, in implied. Integers are basically just uh, numbers, so they can be positive or negative, which we call a signed number, because you can have a positive sign or a negative sign, but it doesn't have any decimal digits to it. Floats, however, do have decimal digits. They can behave as integers as well, if you choose not to include the decimal digits. And Boolean, which is otherwise known as a true or false value. And this otherwise comes from Boolean al algebra, which was founded by a very fa a famous mathematician called George Boole, hence the word Boolean, which is named after him. Most of the time you'll be working with strings and integers throughout your course of your programming experience. Sometimes you might need floats as well. If you think about financial markets, for example, FX, uh, currencies are traded in decimal points. So you will need it there, especially when you're quoting or you're doing algorithmic trading. So you need to assess decimal based values as well or floats rather. So immediately we can jump in now to look at arithmetic operations. So this is very basic. I think if we look at this one, this is a variable X. And it has the result, it stores the result of three multiplied by five. The star implies a multiplication sign. And all I'm doing is printing out that result, which is evidently 15. So if we just want to show that for completion, as, on, as I do a new line there, x equals three, and I use a star, three times five, print x, control, enter, 15. Very straightforward, very nice and easy. So a selection of operators are evidently available. You can do more than just multiplication. You can do addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, exponentiation, which is raising something to a power. So two to the power of three. So two and then two stars and then three. And then modulus, which is very important when you're doing remainder work, uh, which actually prints out the remainder of a division. So for example, 12 mod five is two because five goes into 12 twice, but it leaves a two remainder. The benefit of using the modulus, as you'll see later on, is when you assess for even or odd numbers, because even numbers, when when you divide them by two, leave no remainder, whereas odd numbers leave a remainder of one. So when you do the mod of, for example, three, you get one. And that's a very useful to assess whether you have an even or an odd number. You can also combine operations together. So you use brackets 
just like you would in bid mass if you remember your mathematical studies back in the day. Before we crack on with more sophisticated code, it's always important to label some of the code that you're doing so that in the future, if someone else reads it, or if uh, you're coming back to the code after two or three years of not knowing what you've done, it's always good to remind yourself what you've been doing. So this is where we use something called comments. And that's the point of comments, which is helps to add notes to your code. And we use the hash symbol. Now, the key uh, to notice is that when I run this block of code, as you'll see in a second, is that the is that the hat whatever is um, after the hash sign isn't actually run. It's just uh, it's taken out of the code before it's executed. So when I all that you'll see here is 42. It won't run anything. For example, this code, whatever is said by the comment. As I say here, it's only useful for other programs or when you open the code after a long time. So just to show you that here, if I move there, so I'm going to copy. Well, I'm going to say this code gives me a value of 42. So I say C equals six multiplied by seven. Um, and I can do print C, control enter. It gives me 42. Um, but if I just isolate the cell with a comment, there is nothing executed, nothing is outputted as I showed you earlier. So that is essentially what comments are. And you'll see the rest of the code generally has comments uh, throughout, hopefully, um, definitely in the notebook for sure. Now that we've covered the comments, I think the next part to just quickly browse over. It's not, no, no, but not, nothing in Python is very complicated, but we just need to cover it uh, for your own interest, is to look at relational operators. So sometimes you're not just going to be executing code, you're also going to be comparing two types of data to see what you're going to be doing as a result of that comparison. What we use is called something called relational operators, and they help you to compare the value of two different sets of data. Um, these are the relational operators. Um, we obviously know that operators, for example, the multiplication sign obviously takes the two numbers opposite or opposite sides and then multiplies them together. Relational operators are similar, but it compares them. It doesn't do anything with them. It just compares them and sees which one is bigger or which one is equal, which one is less than the other. Got, um, when we use relational operators, however, remember that we output a true or false value as a result of using it. And that's going to become quite useful when we do something called if statements in a moment. Here's a good example that most of you will be aware of. So we know that the drinking age in this country is 18, but if we have someone that is at the age of 21, we can ask ourselves, is the age of the individual greater than the legal drinking age? If so, then they're allowed to drink. When we look at line five, when we assess this, the print function is going to print the value of true, and that will be used later on to actually make some decisions or print out some special case scenarios. As I'll show you here, um, using this code just for your own interest. So we do a brief comment, check legal age for brevity. My age is 21. Uh, my age is, of course, not 21, but I'm just doing it for description. Legal drinking age is 18. So that's, again, the variable assignment. Print uh, is my age greater than legal drinking age? And some IDEs, you can actually use the tab to autofill, but in this one, it won't let me. Um, so to auto complete the name and then print my age is greater than legal drinking age. I would expect true. Let's see if that works. I hope I haven't got a typo. True. There we go. Of course, if I comment this line of code, I believe I can do that with control. There we go. Control. Um, but forward slash, that also is a shortcut. So if I just run that again, uh, shows that print function does indeed all give me the value of true. I'm just going to undo that, um, as you saw in the presentation. So now that leads us quite well onto something called selections. So sometimes we're not obviously going to be uh, running Python code from top to bottom. Sometimes we might have certain situations where we want some lines to run and other lines not to run. So far, what you've seen is that we run code line by line down the page, uh, as you saw with the previous example. This is otherwise known as a sequence. I'm just going to flick back to the previous pages to show you. All the code is run from line one to line five. It's not like we can skip out line four or so, but we will have to do that at some point. So this is otherwise known as a sequence because the code is run in sequence from top to bottom. However, as I said, we want to sometimes perform certain actions once we've evaluated a condition. That's otherwise known as selection because we're selecting some code to be run at a certain moment. To be more precise, we're 
controlling where the program is flowing with respect to the actual uh, program's code. Uh, so this is otherwise known as flow control. We're controlling the flow or the direction of where the program's headed. The way we do this is we use something called if, else if, which is abbreviated to elif, and else um, as code keywords, and we create code blocks out of these. Code block is very simply a collection of lines that are often run together. And they're obviously shown with indentation, which is very important, as you will see, hopefully, on the next slide. Fantastic. Here we are. So this is essentially what we call an if statement. It's the most simplest case. If we look at line two, we've got my subject. This is indeed my subject. My subject was chemistry. Now, if my subject is indeed equal to chemistry, given by the double equal sign, we, uh, then I can say that my subject, your subject, is awesome. Now, irrespective of whether the if statement is true or false, we're still going to print line five, that IBG is indeed the best. But you can see that lines three and four are what we call a code block because they only run if line three is, if, or code line four rather, only runs if line three is true. So given that this is the case, we can see what happens. Both lines run. What I will show you is in the code itself. So the first line is only printed if uh, the first line, sorry, the fourth line is only printed if my subject was equal to chemistry. And you notice the indentation of line four is very important there. I will fix the typos in due course it is an error of my own part. So we try that here. So uh, evaluate the subject. Move the mouse over. My subject is chemistry, so we'll start there. If my subject is equal to chemistry, and this has to be case sensitive, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, print your subject is awesome. Now I'm going to run that just for now to show you. Indeed, it works. If I, however, also print my other statement that's not inside the indentation, So you see both lines are being run. Now, if I choose a subject that isn't very awesome, I'm trying to think of one. Um, I don't, I'm not particularly keen. Let's try maths, for example. Um, you can see that because maths is not an awesome subject, line four will not run. So only uh, that fifth line will run because it's not within that indentation. It's not within, to be precise, this code block. So, even, so as long as it's outside of this code block, due to the first level of indentation, um, this will only run within this condition. Otherwise, this will always run. I mean, if I can prove my point here. Um, so far away, it still works because it's not indented in the same direction. If I hopefully this will work, if I indent it, it still works because it's in the same indentation level. Hopefully that makes sufficient sense. Um, without mind, I'll move on to the next section um, just in the interest of time. So we can also visualize if statements on paper. So rather than trying to figure out um, how, this in, how this if statement works, we can try and track it using our uh, logic, using, called flow, using something called flowcharts. Um, we can use flowcharts to map out the decision and, and the decisions that are being taken are otherwise known as an algorithm. So if we start, this is the, uh, before we go, this, uh, before we get going with our algorithm, we have a certain key. These keys correspond to certain decisions. So for example, the start and the end, the middle, the diamond is otherwise known as the decision that we have to take. And the parallelogram is an input or an output, as you saw right at the very start. Obviously, we start with uh, our st we'll start in the program. That's obviously given by the rounded rectangle. Are we interested in an IBG quant course? If we're not, then we just say IBG is the best for example, and if you are, uh, you are awesome. There's another code there for you. This is a separate example, of course, to the one I've just shown you, but I just want to get the point across um, for you. And irrespective of whether that's true or false, we're always going to be printing IBG is the best because if we go down or if we go clockwise, we're always going to end up at this output. And we've finished the program. So I hope somebody has claimed that. I'm just going to give it another 15 seconds until someone is claimed a, a code and then we'll move on. Otherwise, for time, I think we're doing quite well. Nothing seems to be too complicated in nature. I think the course is going so well. So another 10 seconds um, to get to 18 past, 18.2, and we'll carry on. Anyway, so far so good, everyone? 
Very good. That's good. Right. And the second, you can also extend that program that you just saw to using something else called an else clause. It essentially is another sort of if statement, but it only works if the first if statement is not valid or is not being met. So, for example, if we look at line two, we have a number. This number is number three. Um, if that number is greater than zero, then we say that my number is indeed positive. However, if it's not positive, then we can print for a we can we can print my number is negative as a backup. So that's what essentially we're evaluating here. So we did we say that my number is positive, and the else is otherwise known as a clause in English grammar. A clause is essentially a word that depends on another uh, another sentence to exist. So for example, um, I went to uh, school. I went to school by bike. By bike is an, is a dependent clause because it depends on the first sentence. I can't just say by bike on my on its own because that doesn't make any sense. I need to have the first sentence. I went to school, which it can exist on its own. That's why we call it a clause. Um, but before we move on to further conditions, we just want to run this code to see if it actually does operate the way I have explained it to you. So my number is indeed three. Let's try. Uh, well, I think I did an odd number, so I should try four. If my number is greater than zero, then I'm, you see that the indentation has automatically been given to me because of the uh, colon. Then I do print. My number is positive. And I print else. So I remove that indentation. Print. My number is negative. So indeed, my number is positive because that's the code block that was valid. So we scroll back over. If we have other conditions as well, we don't just have an if or an else. So that's just two options. We have maybe have three or five or ten. We might be interested in extending our sele uh, selection process using a if l if clause. An l if is basically just shorthand for else if, and you can have many l ifs as you want. So we start with zero. If my number is greater than zero, we say that my number is positive. If my number is indeed exactly equal to zero, then it's either positive or negative, and neither positive or negative, rather, uh, and else my number is negative. And that's essentially the objective with an elif. You're just extending that selection um, if previous conditions are not met. So if I just make that a bit easier, I do. I should have put in a comment a selection of a number. So if I do zero, you can see as well that else uh, won't the if my number is greater than zero won't work. This condition does not meet. Um, obviously, if we have an else, that would be incorrect because zero is not a negative number; it's neutral. So I have to put an elif. If elif my number is indeed equal to zero, print my number is neither negative or positive. Hopefully this works. Fantastic. So you can see how that elif came about it was because I needed to test for one more condition. It's all very nice. There is, uh, we can extend this as well a bit more to evaluate further conditions by something, something that we call nesting. Essentially, nesting is the objective of putting if else statements inside an if statement. It's what we call a nest because the, to put it uh, in good terms, this outs, what we call the outside statement, uh, if elif else, is actually encapsulating or rather nesting this inside if statement. That's where we, the nesting term comes from because it's encapsulating or is what we call the inner selection process. Uh, inner selection process, of course, this one, the outer one is the first one. So if we look at this one, if we try and follow this through, uh, my number is, indeed, is five. So if my number is greater than zero, which is indeed true, we have to then evaluate for whether it's even or odd. So we start, we, we meet this criteria, so we move into the second selection process here. And then we say if my number with the modulus of two, so if we get the remainder of this number divided by two and it's equal to zero, um, and then indeed that number is even. But if the modulus is not equal to zero, i.e. it's one or uh, an odd number, then it, my number is odd. So indeed in this case, my number would be odd um, because of the modulus. So if I just try that here, so if my number is greater than zero, then what I'll do is I'll comment this to, um, just for your own personal interest. Then I have to test again. If my number 
the, of the modulus of two is equal to zero. That indentation is automatically given to me. And I have to print my number is even. Else print my number is odd. Um, now I have to also switch from number round, so it's not zero, it's five. Press enter, my number is indeed odd. That's very simple, very straightforward. And this is indeed known as nesting, so we have an inner if statement, so that's the one here, that's with the highest indentation, which is wrapped around by an elif clause uh, normally here. In this case, it wouldn't. it's not actually an elif clause, it's, it's the if clause here. We can extend this as well to looking at loops, so this is where it gets slightly more interesting. We can also repeat a selection over and over again in once a criteria is met. And this is otherwise known as something called iteration, because iteration means to constantly repeat over and over again. We can we can normally do this quite a lot with numerical conditions. I'll show you a flow chart here. Again, this is the key. Um, the new thing that you see here is a rectangle. This is called a process. It's where we actually do something. Uh, we're not taking data in or we're pushing data out. We're not making a decision and we're not starting anything or ending anything. We're actually doing something. So, for example, we start by creating a variable x, which is equal to the value of zero. Then we print x, so we're going to get zero straight away. Which we ask, is x less than or equal to five? Indeed it is, it's zero at the moment. So we're going to increase it by one. But then what happens is that loop goes round, we print one, and then we're going to ask that question again. Is it less than five? Yes, it is. So we're going to add one to it again, and we're going to print two. We're going to print one, two, three, four, and five before we end it. And you can see uh, just by looking at the pure nature of the color that that's why we call it a loop. Um, that's why iteration is also called, called looping because of the closed loop that we've created there. Actually, we get uh, six because it's less than or equal to five. So when, when it, x equals five, is x less than or equal to five? Indeed it is. We add one more, print it, and then we end the program. And there are two types of iteration as a result of this. So if we want to loop a finite number of times, so we have a, we have a limit that we want to reach, it's otherwise known as a for loop, essentially means that we, uh, we call it definite loops, so we only loop it a certain number of times. So if we look at this very simple code, we're just looping all the numbers from zero to, uh, from zero to three, but not including three. Uh, and what we do is essentially we give the for loop a variable. In this case, we've called it i, but it can be any loop. So for example, we say for num in range, for i in range, for elephant in range, we just print that value of i. You saw that previously from the flowchart. It's essentially that what we're doing here. We're just constraining the tech, we're constraining the syntax to make it a bit easier. So essentially we're setting x here to be the resulting variable. Um, we're just calling it i here because that's the convention in looping or iteration rather, that's why it's called i. In this case, we'd get zero to two. Um, I'm moving that over just for to show you on code. The range, uh, hopefully that will, uh, will print. So if I print range of three, range is a function, which is a bit more complicated, but I'm hopefully that it will work with me. It, yes, so what I've done, list of range is essentially a function. You give it a value and it will, give, re, it will return to you uh, a list of values, as you'll see in a moment, all the values from zero to that number, but not including the number that you've provided. I've given it the number three, so it will print all the numbers from zero to three, but not including three. It's what we call an exclusive parameter because three is not included in our result. I've then just converted that to list uh, and then just printed it out for you, although that's far beyond the realms of this current discussion for the moment. But I just wanted to show you how the range works. So as you see from the code here, if I do four i in range three, print i, what I will be getting is for each time that we go through that loop that you saw earlier, we start with zero as, I, as the range function provides. I will be equal to zero the first time, so we print it. Then we go around in the loop again. I will be equal to one, we print it. I will be equal to two, we print it, and so on and so forth. This is just the computer science way of writing that flowchart that you saw earlier. Um, but essentially, so I can run it now, and that's the result. And you can call it anything. I mean, I called it elephant earlier. Entirely the same thing, as long as you're consistent with the variable that you call it and the printing variable, then it's all the same. Uh, but as you saw earlier, I'm just going to put it back to X um, as well, just to show you for the uh, flowchart. 
And I'll just go back to I as well. But that flowchart is basically the reason that the for loop works. I wanted to show you that first so that the syntax becomes a bit easier. Yes. Well, that was going to be the next part of that uh, presentation, but it was a good question to show you. You just set one to three. Hopefully that works. One to three. But if you, normally, if you want to include that number that you're doing, all you can do is just a plus one. Does that make sense? You, you just sort of hard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you do. You just so you, you do I and then you just in those little brackets, you just put the number that you want. Make sense? So the gentleman there was asking, what if I wanted a starting number? So I don't want to start from zero. Uh, you'll see in a moment he was very good at aware, making himself aware of that. And if you want to include that number three, all you do is just do the plus one. It's a little trick to get you around the exclusivity nature of the range function. So it's exclusive because we're excluding that number. But it was a good point. Well done. So the number that we pass into the loop is not included in the final result. But if we do a plus one into the parameter, we can just sort of get around that problem quite nicely. If we did have a starting number, as the gentleman mentioned, that we wanted to specify, uh, it would be very simple. Um, we can just include this starting and an ending number using the range function. So the starting number is inclusive. The ending number is still exclusive. We don't include it. But as I showed you, you can do a plus one to get around that. So as I sh we'll just do that on a separate line. So for i, we'll do x or b rather, for b in range one to five, print b. I just scroll down, same point there. Um, it doesn't include five, but I just add one to it because it doesn't include the last number. I can do that. The reason for that is, of course, if I just show you um, on the next line, uh, print the list of range. Um, so five will obviously uh, print up to four. So if I do five plus one, it will include five for me as well. That's just uh, the reasoning behind why that works. That's all very good. Uh, we're doing very good on time, actually. Um, not wasting anyone's time, hopefully. Uh, here, the variable i is known as a counter variable because it's the variable that keeps track of where your loop is, as you saw in the flowchart. You can use any name, as I mentioned, j, k, a, b, c, one, two, three. It's perfectly fine, as long as it doesn't exist previously in the code. You can give it whatever name you want, as long as it doesn't previously exist, because what happens is you overwrite that previous variable um, because the way that code works, the last variable that you declare is the last value that it has. So if I or if I have something called x at the very top and I have x at the very bottom, the x, the, the value of x that I'll get at the end, through, at the end of the program is the one that I just, the one at the very bottom because it's the last one that I declared, um, or initialized rather. So with that in mind, uh, we can now look at nested for loops, which is slightly more exciting. It's basically a loop inside a loop. Um, if you look at this one, for example, we have an outer loop and line two is called. Uh, we've got an x in range one to four. It's very straightforward. It gives you the numbers one to four, um, but we've got an inner loop. Um, so it will print out all the values um, in the range of, well, it says one here, but it should be three, I think. I'm going to change that now because that's not very nice. Um, no way, so if I just page down, I'll page up a bit. Three. There you go. I don't want to get the wrong impression. There you go. So that fixes that. Uh, this is the result that you'll get. This does look a bit complicated if we look at it from the outset, but here is how it works. If we look at the outer loop. The outer loop starts at x equals one, and we have to complete the inner loop before we switch back to the outer loop and increment that value. So the outer loop starts at x equals one, as you can see. Uh, for the first three and the inner loop is, is starts at zero for y so it's y one times zero is zero the next one x equal one still remains because the inner loop hasn't been finished yet y equals one so one times one equals one and then for the final inner loop x still remains at one because we haven't finished the inner loop but the inner loop is now done y equals two so one times two equals two so we have zero one and two as you can see here once that first inner loop is done for the x value of one, we then increment or increase x by one. We now start with x equal two. Well, then we look, work into the inner loop. The inner loop then repeats itself, y equals zero, and we start again, two times zero is zero, two times one is two, two times two is four. Finally, once that is done, we just do the three, x equals three. So then we start with x equals three, we loop 
y equals zero, y equals one, y equals two, and then we're done. That's what um, nested loops is. As you can see there, this loop that contains y is incremented or it lives inside an outer loop. That's why it's nested, otherwise it, it's contained. If I just show you that live on code. So for a in range uh, two to five, so that will do two, three, and four. For B in range, let's try three to seven. So that will do the three, four, and five times tables of two and two, and two, three, and four. Print, hopefully, A multiplied by B. There you go. Six, eight, 10, 12. Sorry, two, three, four. Yep. And yep. 2, 6, 8, 10, 12, 9, 12, 15, 18, 12, 16, 20, 24. Yeah, in the inner loop. So 3, 4, 5, and 6. Cool. That all makes sense to you so far? Very, very straightforward, hopefully. Um, but yeah, so that's the real underlying reason for why that nested loop works. So as long as you track yourself with that sort of diagram, it makes it quite easy. Here, we're going to start to move on a bit from sort of four loops. And now we're going to look at loops that won't ever, uh, that may run for a while until we hit a certain condition. This is otherwise known as a while loop. The reason why we call it a while loop is we can't, we actually run something while that condition is still true, hence the word while. We look at this example, we have a while loop. It starts at x equals one, and we say that while x is less than or equal to eight, we print x. So when we start at one, indeed, one is less than or equal to eight. So we print it and then we increase it by one. So x now becomes two. Two is it that meets the condition. So we print two, still true. And while three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. But when we get to nine, we realize that while loop no longer works because nine is not less than or equal to eight. So we stop printing it and we cancel. That's indeed what you see there. Um, that's very straight. Hopefully that's very straightforward. If I just show you here. Um, x equals one while x is well, let's change the letter h equals two while h is less than or equal to nine so indeed right now it is when i start it and while it carries on print h but then i also have to increment h by one so hey this uh, little thing here and i'm just going to comment it for you uh this means h equals h plus one it's just a shorthand for us to not type h over again. It makes things easier. If I print that, hopefully this doesn't crash on me. Fantastic. Obviously, to change the numbers a bit, two to nine. Um, but yeah, it's the same concept as always, just a different practice. How do while loops compare to for loops? So they're very similar, but it's just indefinite. We don't know when it's going to end until that condition has been met or fulfilled. Same thing here, it's the same type of diagram. X is less equal to one, still keeps on running, but we always make sure that that condition is met at the end before we stop, uh, or is not no longer met rather, and we always make sure that we increment our value. Python only has while loops as a type of indefinite loops. Some other languages will vary, but I won't discuss them. And of course, this is what you get. It is important, however, to always increment the plus one uh, for x. It is important. The reason for that is that if we look at this loop, for example, we start with one, is let x less than or equal to eight? Yes, and then we print it. Notice that because we haven't incremented it, x always remains at one. I would like to show you, but I'm not sure if my notebook is going to crash, but we're welcome to give it a go uh, in a moment. If it does, then that would help us. So uh, we start at one. Is x less than or equal to eight? Yes, so we print. But notice because there's no, increment, no incrementation, we come back around. Is x still less than or equal to eight because it's still equal to one? Yes. And we go round and round and round in an endless loop until we stop it. Actually, you know what? Um, so yeah, you do become stuck in an infinite loop and it does remain indefinitely. So it's never closed or terminated in terms of the loop. Keeps on going forever and ever until you try this at home. Since we're at Imperial and this isn't my computer, we can uh, give this a go. So I'll uh, open a new notebook for this special one and I'll um, split the screen. Provided this works, right, let's give this a go. So X is equal to one while X is less than or equal to eight. Print x. All right, here goes. No worries. There you go. Then you can see it keeps on printing one, and you can see right on the bottom it tells you how long this is going on for. I could leave this going on for the whole day because nothing's going to change it. To stop this, I think believe in some it's, some programs called Control C. 
my plea doesn't work here. Um, but at some point, the RAM is going to start to use itself up. Um, so I can just stop there, to be honest, if it will let me. There you go. It took a bit long. And then essentially it told, it's telling that I had to interrupt this program with my keyboard and it's keyboard interrupt. Um, but try not to do that. Always remember to increment your variable. The first thing you do before you even uh, print anything in addition, for example, your print function. I'm just going to do that. So that's an infinite loop. I haven't been commenting in the interest of time, but I'm just trying to keep myself there. So crack on. So strings. A bit about strings um, before we move any further. Strings are basically indexed. What we mean by that is that each letter has a associated number which refers to its position in the uh, string. So if we look at this Python uh, string, P-Y-T-H-O-N, there are two ways of indexing it. There's two ways of applying a number in terms of its position in the list, in position in the word. So we would say that normally Python, the letter P is the first character, but in computer, computer science, we always say that the first position will give the value zero, as you'll see in a moment why. This is all like the top line over here, uh, that means the numbers on the top are otherwise known as a positive index, because they're all positive numbers and they're all being indexed with a positive number. We can also start negatively. Uh, so negative means that with the last number, the last letter rather, is given the value of number one. So there's two different ways of doing it, and it entirely depends on your own needs. And the way we retrieve a, a letter is we use the square bracket operator. So we use two square brackets. So for example, if we typed the uh, Python in strings and then followed it by a number five or Python with a minus one, they both return the letter in. I'll show you that here. Um, depends, some, some uh, IDs allow me to do this. So if I try it here, Python minus five, minus one rather, sorry, minus one. That's N uh, and five, N there as well, case in point. Why is this the case? Why don't we just start from number one? The reason is to do with computer science. It's because it's, uh, it's easier actually in terms of memory. If we start with zero from the start to the end, um, what happens is that the computer essentially has a uh, computer memory and it's essentially like looking at a map or looking at an address to be precise. So the uh, computers also have addresses inside the memory to tell you where data is. If I say that the, if I was in the same way that I'd say that my house is at 25 Kensington Gardens, computer also has, for example, this piece of data is stored at uh, location 300. If I want to actually be efficient, I would use a zero index because in terms of actually arranging the letters, memory is contiguous. So we try contiguous and we mean that all the data is arranged right next to each other one by one. Sometimes you have something called fragmentation, which is where you've got one letter in one location, one letter in another location. We have to bring them in. That's very inefficient. So computers try to make everything as efficient as possible by packing them all together. The problem is if we're trying to locate an element um, using, we, 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 rather, if we do it with a zero offset index, we know that, for example, our letter, um, y or uh, letter Y, yet yeah, is one from the start. So we can say that the address where our first letter is, this is 300. And all I have to do is I have to go to find 300 and I just do 300 plus um, the size of the element, which in this case, it refers to the size of each of the um, letters in the memory. So it's around eight bytes. And all I do is I want the number one, so the N is equal to one, I can immediately get that. So address 300 plus one, 301 times the size of the element. That's a computer science expression. However, the point is, um, if we don't, if we actually say, for example, that we start with one, uh, one, two, three, four, we have to do an n to minus one subtraction. That's one, otherwise known as a one offset. But because we have a subtraction, that makes things a bit slower. Um, and if you think about it, this is only just looking for one letter. If you've, a computer works with billions of letters, and if it's being slowed down by a few nanoseconds and you've got billions of operations to do in a second, that computation speed will obviously all add up uh, to make things very slow. So that's why even though this is marginally faster for one operation, if we aggregate everything, it's a lot faster to do it with a zero offset than a one offset. But that's a theoretical reason why. So if we look at the actual code. Um, we can actually extract letters from a string by using the operator that I mentioned. So again, just as you saw previously, um, with the range, 
the starting index is inclusive, but it does it is being extracted, but the ending one is not. So we can also in introduce a third parameter, which is otherwise known as a step. I'll just show you that here. If we do Python one two five, that means that we're extracting all the letters from one to five, but not including the fifth character. So that's Y T H O, with five being exclusive. If I want to do Python one to five with a two, that means go take all the letters from the first to the fifth character, but skip every second one. That gives you Y, skip one, so get the second one after that, H, obviously we don't include five. That's why it's Y, H. I'll show you that here. So one to five gives me Y, T, H, O. And if I include a little step, so how much to jump over, gives me Y and H. I think we're more than halfway, which is nice. So with that in mind, we can look a bit at data structures. So using variables for a collection of single values is indeed inefficient. What I mean by that is we can't do, for example, item one, item two, item three, item four, item five. It's very inefficient because we're taking up a lot of the computer's memory and that's going to slow things down. Obviously, on the, on the very nanoscale level, but if we're writing very big programs, it's very inefficient because uh, we have dis uh, dis uh, dis diseconomies of scale, rather. Python does have special cases, uh, data structures for special cases, especially for a collection of items, and we call them organized collections, or much easier, we just call them a list. Um, so we have lists, we have tuples, we have sets, and we have dictionaries. Sets not really that special, it's just maths. People tend to get hard on for it, but it's entirely their own use. Lists are basically just ordered collections of items that have a specific index. So just as you saw with the um, string, we also have numbers that associate with the position of that item in, in the list. So as you'll see here with this grocery list, we have apples, milk, bananas, cereal, and cake. Apples are, of course, the first item in the list, so we give them value zero. Cake, of course, is the last one, so we give it 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or minus 1 if we're counting it backwards. That's what we mean by ordered collection of items with a specific index, as I'll show you here. So if we want to write my grocery list, so gross, uh, list of my groceries. Uh, so my groceries is equal to, and I'm just going to uh, type it here, apples, milk, milk bananas, cereal, Pick and then just do print groceries. That's my list there. And I can obviously, just analogous to my grocery list, I can also use that to store a list of items. Very good. So if we uh, expand on this, I can actually use this list to actually get some certain data out. So for example, item number three on the list, um, which is rather incorrect in light of what I've just said, would be the number two. I'll just update it and I'm going along. Um, item three on the list is uh, groceries um, three. Rather, actually, um, I'm going to do item four on the list is groceries three. This is a brief reading error. So item three on the list is indeed uh, cereal. Rather, I meant item four on the list. I do apologize. This is just an issue of my own. There we go. That should fix things. So uh, item four on the list is indeed um, groceries because of the zero offset, but we will also have lists with a mix of different data types. So it doesn't just have to be lists with the same data type, it can also be lists of a different data type. So we've got 34, true, blockchain 3.14, we've got a num we've got an integer, a boolean, a string, and a float, or a decimal to be precise. So if we just look at that as an example, so if I want to print my first my first item on my grocery list is, I put a little space in there just so I can get the space when I print it, and I do groceries, and I just do zero because that's now zero offset now that I'm actually thinking straight. Hopefully this works. It is indeed apples, fantastic. And I just do a little full stop just to make that look like a proper sentence that I've actually imagined that I've said it out loud. So my first item on my grocery list is apples. And just to show you the point about lists, we're also having different types of data. So I can have a data. So um, I've done there. So I've done 1.68. That's a float. Uh, imperial, that's a spring. Uh, false, as the other Boolean. And the other one, um, maybe just 240. Works just as well. And it just prints out the same stuff that was in there. 
We also looked at, just briefly earlier, we looked at looping a list, looping through um, numbers. We also looped through a list. It also helps us to extract every item from a list when we look at iteration. So we've obviously just used a for loop, and this is where actually the for loop really has its power, because we can obviously print the list, as you saw here earlier, just um, gross, so, uh, print groceries. So I'm just going to overwrite just my example. Just it prints out the list, but that's not very um, doesn't look very nice because it just looks like code. But what I can do is use a for loop and essentially say that for each of the item in the list of groceries, just print another item out for me on its own line. So I can do for item in groceries. Colon is essential because if you don't do that, the semicolon won't work. But I'll show you. You can try and manually indent it. Print item, but it will say that you have. It was expecting a colon. It was expecting a colon indeed. And now I can print each of the items line by line. It looks much more elegant. As you just saw there. Lists and arrays, however, are not equivalent. Um, arrays is more of an old thing that you saw in maybe C++ back in the day. In Python, we call it lists. The reason is because um, a list, as you saw in the previous example, allow different types of data uh, in, in a list. But uh, arrays don't allow that, especially in C, uh, C++ or very original C. But we'll see that later on, hopefully. So far, so good. Now, so lists in one dimension, so just a list of items going from left to right. We can also have 2D lists, for example, if you have a table. So uh, 2D lists are otherwise known as two dimensional or they actually represent tables and matrices. An example would be this. It doesn't look very keen as to what that actually is. It just looks like a collection of numbers. It doesn't look that all, all that appetizing, but actually it represents a table, a table of values, specifically the, the values that you can see in a three by three from the bottom right. And this will be how you would store a table in uh, Python. So you've got the dimension, the first dimension, that's the one. Um, so the second dimension, rather, or the first one going downwards, that's your months, that's going from left to right. You've also got the dimensions going from up to down, that's your years. Two dimensions, 2D, hence two dimensional. And to show you how that would be done, um, I'm going to put some random numbers in, but it'd be, it'd be simple as data equals. Um, you use your square brackets to denote the list. Press, en press enter, rather, and the indentation is already taken care of. So I'm going to copy the numbers here. 15.2, 16.2, and 17.3. That's one row. I'm going to do a comma, then I do another row. 20.1, 23.2, 25.4. Put the comma in. 30.3, uh, 35.6, and 39.9. I run that. Of course, um, save them the uh, data. I'll just do print. Hopefully, that should. Yeah, but that's how you represent a three by a two a, a two dimensional table in the three by three matrix, which is very good so far. Hopefully, that makes sense. This is obviously looking at the real life application and converting that to computer code. We can also work with two D lists. Um, so we can use loops, as you saw, the nested loops to be precise, to access all the elements of a 2D list. Elements just mean each of the cells in the table. So, for example, if I wanted to add all these numbers together, take all the numbers and just add them together, we would use a nested for loop. So we start by looking at each of the rows. So for each row in the data, then I would nest the loop again. I'll say for each item in the row, each of the numbers in each of the rows, just add them to my running variable total. So my total starts at zero and I just add numbers to it. So I look at the first row, 15.2 plus 16.2 is 31.4, 31.4 plus 17.3 is uh, 48.7, I believe. And then you just keep on adding all the rows and all the numbers together. And that should get you something like 223.2. Uh, this 0 0.00002 is just a, uh, it's just a program. It's just the way that the computer works. It has a certain resolution with which it adds numbers. So that's just an artifact of the way the computer works. It's not actually a mathematical error. But to show you that, so if I just remove this, um, so I do total, so I start, a, so I create a run, a counter variable, start it at zero. So, and I say for each of the rows for in the data, and then for each of the items in the rows, notice that we have the row in data, but this variable corresponds to the previous variable there, because obviously we're saying for each of the items in the row. Uh, so that's something you'll see the more you do it. Our total is going to, we're going to do total equals 
total, so the total plus item. So for example, right at the start, zero equals, so total equals the original value zero plus 15.2, that's 15.2. Then and the next time we loop it, we take 15.2, add 16.2, that's 31.4, and then just loop it again. 31.4 plus 17.3 is 48.7, um, hopefully. Um, but obviously, as you saw earlier, I can just get rid of that total. Um, I just use the incrementation operator. Um, and just do print total, get that out of that loop. Um, so these are just information that tells me how the loop works uh, or the print function works. And that's not very relevant, but it's quite useful. Hopefully this does work. 39.9, um, um, that's not entirely correct. Four item in a row. Yeah, ah, my bad. My bad. There we go. Thank you very much. So yeah, as I said, order of parameters do matter. That was my bad. Um, because I'd have the assignment operator. I just thought it would be clever to delete it. Uh, cool. So that's very consistent so far. And yes. Yes. That looks exactly like the arrays they showed. You had a NumPy array, didn't you? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so and NumPy arrays are basically arrays that are built on top of that, but they're a bit more specialized. So what we're doing is we're manually adding all the numbers together. Um, in NumPy, you can just say NumPy add or whatever it is, NumPy.sum, and it will automatically, we don't have to write the for loop, we just have to write one word. Okay. NumPy is essentially specialized code that saves you from doing all this stuff. NumPy is more sophisticated because it's numerical Python. That's what it's designed for. Does that make sense? Yeah. Obviously, we're doing it from the ground up, so you, you won't do as much when you're doing it more professionally, but you understand this now so that you have more than one way of you know, cutting a, a problem into half. Do you see what I mean? So just doing this just for sake of completion, but you are right. NumPy is what you would use more sophisticated-wise. Cool. So um, just to quickly move on, we are actually very well on time. I thought we'd end at eight, but I think we're going to get closer to quarter two or half past. Uh, tuples, very similar. Uh, they are just like lists, but you can't change a tuple. They are immutable because mutable or mutation means things change. Immutable is the opposite. You can't change it once you've been creating them. Good example would be for weekends. Weekends, uh, weekdays, sorry, weekdays, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you can't change that. Those are the weekdays. I can't just say Sunday is a weekday. It is quite useful, actually, to use a tuple in certain programming concepts, such as, for example, weekdays, but also, for example, names of countries, because you can't change the name of a country. GB, Great Britain. So that's a uh, not country, but you get the point. Uh, nationalities, so on and so forth. If you do, however, try to um, uh, change the list, uh, it will not work. You can, however, use it to print stuff, but you can't change it. So if we look at this, for example, so uh, let's quickly look over. Weekdays. I'm going to check as well if I have the assignment. Um, I didn't actually include it in this lecture, but I'll try. Weekdays equals Monday, Tuesday. Rather, I'll just do the three days ago. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, right? We all agree those are the days of the week that are weekdays. I want to get the first day of the week, weekdays, zero. I'm not printing it. And in, in, in this code, in notebooks, you can just, you don't need the print, but in more sophisticated, in actual IDEs, you do. But um, we're just doing it now just for the interest of time. But always try and use print. That is indeed Monday. That obviously works. However, um, I'm just going to sort of diverge a bit. If we remember the list of groceries, I'm just going to bring that back up there. Um, if I want if I want to ask what the first item in the groceries list is, it's indeed apples. I can, however, and I'm just for the sake of things as well, I'm just going to have that there so you can see. I can also change items in the list. So if I want to change apples to, uh, um, let's say, pears, for example, groceries, all I have to do is I have to say which position I want to change. I want to change the first one and then just assign it, just like you would assign a variable, Pairs. Right. Um, and then I'm just going to go underneath, so get the groceries out again. Changes apples into pears. However, tuples, as you saw with the weekdays, don't allow you to do that. And it will just tell you to go away because it will give you an error. So if I change the weekdays, if I change the 
let's say I change the second weekday, remember, zero on, in zero offset, to a Sunday. That's obviously completely rubbish, but let's try it. No, Apple object does not support so does not support item assignment. Basically, what it's saying is you can't change a tuple. You can't equal or some, add something new. Yes. That feels quite like the because um, surely it's just a user variable that would never have to reassign. I just reassign that variable later. On. Yes. Because that's like not changing the variable. But sometimes you might want. To, sometimes, for example, if you're creating an app, right? Um, you know, when you sign up, you have that list of countries in the world, right? Mm. You don't want that list. You don't want someone hacking in and changing that list or a programmer accidentally changing that, right? Okay. All those lists are constant. That's always going to be there, you know, prevent, prevent accidents, but also for consistency, right? For example, United Kingdom is never going to change, right? And it's, but normally yeah, that's the case. Um, that's why you do the tuple. You use it for consistency. Also, for example, if you're doing like days of the week or months of the year, if you're selecting a day, you always want that to be a tuple because you might want to make sure no other programmer hard codes July as the fourth month when it's the seventh, right? Do you see what I mean? Okay. No, you don't want someone because that's what we, sometimes there's certain programs, uh, concepts called injection, where you can change a website by injecting a bit of code, pushing it the other way. If you have a tuple, you can't just change July to, you can't just change March into July. It will stop that from happening. It will just throw an error. It's precisely. Also for uh, programming generally, it's just good. If you have a constant, fix it as a constant with a tuple. Yes. You can, but then you'd have to run that whole program all over again. Uh, or compile it rather. Yeah, they, there's diff there are different ways. There are different ways, but generally, if I'm a user, I don't want to have that opportunity to change, for example, the days of the week. That can only happen from people working in that company. Or even then, you wouldn't want the junior developer to accidentally mess around with it. You just want that to stay how it is. That, and also, it's easy to actually know whether something's wrong, because the only way that days of the week have changed is if you hard code, if you change the hard coded nature of it. So you also find it easy to troubleshoot. Does that make sense? So that's the basic nature of it. It's good to ask though. It's always good to ask why something is, not just what something is. Um, but hopefully that's all been sufficient for you guys so far. Only a couple of slides more. Um, right, so they do work just like lists as you saw, but you can't change them. Uh, to edit lists, we're going to need something called methods, which are basically like functions, but then more specific to the data types that we have. We'll look onto that just very shortly. Uh, there is a code on the bottom right, so help yourself. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to talk a bit about dictionaries. So dictionaries are just like the actual dictionaries that you get for an English dictionary. You have a key and you have a value. For example, in the actual dictionary, you have a uh, a word that you're looking up. Uh, so for example, I say crypto and you get the definition. So the crypto is the key, the value is the definition. Uh, each unit of information, so for example, crypto and definition, otherwise known collectively as an item. Here's an example. We use curly braces this time to denote that it's a dictionary and not a list. So um, here what we've got, we've got dictionary. BTC is the shorthand for Bitcoin and ETH is the shorthand for Ethereum. However, one thing that I would like to bear in mind is that dictionaries are unordered. They have no numbers associated with them. So BTC, Bitcoin, is the first item that I've declared in the dictionary, but I can't just do uh, coins square bracket zero because that's not how it exists in the memory. Um, it's actually more uh, complicated than that. But bottom line is uh, you can't put a number to any of the items. You just use the key. Um, I shall show you that once someone has processed the code in 10 seconds time uh, to see how that works in practice. It's all very simple. But here you have no ordering. You just chuck in a key and a value, and it doesn't matter what order. It can be it can be unalphabetical. But the point is you have a key and a value. That's the point of it. So. I'll just do that here quickly. That's the, that's the 10 seconds there. I'll just remove this error as well. So coins. I'll get the tickers out for each of the coins. Uh, so I'm going to do SOL, which I believe is Solana. Uh, do that in lowercase. That's Solana. That's a dictionary because I have the key and the corresponding value. And I'm just going to do BTC, rather. BTC for Bitcoin. Uh, you can see, uh, obviously, the dictionary has been created. I just click that tick on the far right tells me it's all good. Now I can just do print coins. And I give it the one of these two keys. Notice that the computer's automatically provided that for me. So I shall do SOL. 
gives me Solana, give me a definition. Now, as I showed you, if I try to just say coins zero, this might have changed, but as far as I recall, this wasn't the case. See, key error, key error zero. Basically, what it's saying is there's no index associated with the dictionary. That's the bottom line. Um, but if I'll just remove that, and let's try BTC this time, just for your interest. Bitcoin. I can't actually, however, use a value to find out its key. That's not possible. It only works one way. So I can't do Solana and ask what the key was because actually Solana doesn't exist on the left hand side. It's a key error. No keys exist. But you can use a key to find its value. So that's Bitcoin. There you are. Uh, they behave like a language dictionary. So in the English language, you do have a word and its associated definition. Rather, you have a keyword and associated definition. Uh, so if you look at the definition equals crypto, which is a digital currency, you have your key, you have your value. All together, they make an item. Now, we're moving on to the very end of this, le le this lecture, and we're quite ahead of time, which is fantastic. Subroutines. Routine is basically just a series of steps that you take, uh, it was an action, a series of actions that you take place, that take place rather. And they're basically just blocks of code that are self-contained. You saw what a block was. Self-contained means they just live on their own. They're independent of other code and you can move them around. Basically, when we run code from top to bottom, the functions live separately and they can't actually be executed unless we ask for them. You'll see that momentarily. For example, you might have situations where the code may need to be repeated, may be, need to be repeated many times. There's an example in the notebook, which I may have here. Um, if I show you here, it's a better example than I can um, describe at the moment. Since we have the time, I can just slow down a bit. For example, if we look at here, so we've got a simple greeting. We've got a simple computer that just says print hello, comma the name. First name was Ahmed, that was me. Then it was Imran, who was the founder, and it was Joseph. You notice this is very redundant, it's repeating itself over and over again. What I can do is I can essentially just um, use a function to just uh, actually do the hello, comma, and the string, and just me just passing in the name, and it will take care of that for me. And that's essentially what a string does. Um, here, for instance, so this is what it was doing. So you do a hello, comma, and then the name. If I say Ahmed, it says Ahmed. And then if I say Armand, Imran, and Joseph, it just says Armand, Imran, and Joseph. It's a lot simpler. There's no variable assignment, um, and it just does it on its own. That's what we mean by repeating it many times. And you only call it when you need it, right? I'm only calling this greeting function when I need it. So calling a subroutine, that's the verb. It means just when you're actually using it in the script. So I'm calling it. I'm making use of it. There are two types of subroutines in Python. There's one that we define as users. We are the ones who create them and need them for our own needs. And there are also methods, which are the ones that the system provides for us, especially with certain data types. Functions are the very simple ones. We've already described them, but here's how they actually work. So functions that don't return values uh, are called procedures, special name. Basically, uh, they, we, with return, so remember it spits out a value uh, that we can use, uh, for example, an assignment to a variable that doesn't exist here. It's just what we call the procedure. A print function is not actually a return value. A print function is just chucking something onto a screen. A return value is more when we use this function, we calculate a number and then we assign that to a variable. We're not assigning anything to a variable here, hence it's not, uh, it's, hence it's a special type of function called a procedure. The diagram here will show you, if I push in Satoshi, it will, uh, we use greeting, we use the greeting function and it will output hello Satoshi on the far right, which is what we get so whatever we pass into our function, we're going to say hello, comma, space, and then the name Satoshi or any other name that we use. However, there may be cases where we want to store the data into a variable, and that's where the return keyword helps. Just to illustrate that point, so if we write a new code, so define the greeting, uh, and then we say name. This is the input that we provide, and it's just a placeholder for us. Print hello, comma. Uh, your name is rather, and then plus name. Now, name is just a placeholder, so it, it's just basically showing us how the function works. So it's a parameter. So whatever we include inside those brackets is going to be saved as a name variable, and then that's how it's going to get into the print function. So if we do greeting, let's say my, uh, let's say someone else, uh, Noor, for example, greeting Noor. Hello, your name is Noor. So what happens is that nor passes in to the function, 
that gets saved as name. And then when we run this code, we know that name now exists as nor. And then hello, your name is nor is being given out. However, if we want to take advantage of the function, we might want to use it to calculate something. For example, um, and this is quite interesting. Actually, it's not zero. It should be four. I'm actually, picking up my mistakes as I go along. Um, so, if we want, if we have a function in this case, which has, um, uh, which actually gives us the value of the area of a square, all we have to do is provide the side length. So what we do is we calculate the variable area, which is the side squared, and then we return that. When we return it, what basically happens is where we call the function area square four, this function is evaluated. That number is then saved to this <clears throat> to this variable as a return value. So when we print it, what happens is we enter the value four, area of four is evaluated, and we get 16, but 16 is then saved to the variable air square area square four. So we get the value of 16. Prove that here for your own self-interest. Uh, define area of square. So we give it a side length. I'm going to just change the variable name, uh, the parameter name rather. So area equals side length exponentiated, so squared, and then we return area. How that helps is if we have area squared, let's not say four, let's say eight equals area of square eight. And then we print area square eight, 64. Indeed, eight squared is indeed 64. How this works rather is if I wanted to do, use this function again, area square five equals area of square Five, I can use that exact same function again without having to rewrite the whole um, mathematics. Print area square five. It prints both values. Even better, I can just be very quick and say area of, print me the area of square with a dimension of 10. Hundred. And I'm just using that function over and over again without actually having to write all that multiplication over and over again. That's why functions exist. So the return essentially sends the output back to the variable it was called from, as you saw here. So it returns it back to area square four and it tells it to save it. Um, in this case, it would be in line four, but you cannot access the value of the variable area inside the function. So here is area exists in this code block, but in functions, I can't then, for example, access it outside of this indentation. Um, this is otherwise, this is due to the fact that area is local to this function, but it's not global to the whole program. That's essentially what local scope and global scope mean. So in, if I try to, now the last one I put in was 10. So I would expect 100 uh, as the value, of, as the variable value of area. If I try and print area, however, I'm just going to comment these lines out so they don't affect it. I've, I've got area of square 10, and that's going to print out 100. But if I try and break into that black box, I'll say what are the transparent blocks of the box of the function and try and get area. It will not work. It says area is not defined. It doesn't mean that area is not defined as in it doesn't exist. It only exists inside this function. The reason for this is that functions essentially are um, get destroyed once they've been used up. So by the time we get to here, at the bottom of the program, this function is already destroyed in memory. And so the program says, I have no idea what variable you're talking about. It doesn't exist. The reason is because the computer destroyed any trace of that front function, it's destroyed any trace of the variable area before it got around to you investigating it. That's why you can't access a variable that lives inside that function. That's the actual technical reason that you probably haven't heard before. So there are also just some uh, special things. There are also some functions that don't require any input. Um, they just give you an output straight away. So this one, for example, print fact, just prints out a fact for me. Um, just to print it out, I have to just include the variable name and include the parentheses. Even if I don't include any input values, I still have to include the parentheses to highlight the fact that I'm trying to run this function. So if I do uh, the next one, so define uh, print fact. I'm not actually passing anything. All I say want to say is print. Imperial is number, I think it's three in the UK. Um, 
print fact. Now, just to highlight, if I try that right now, that function does exist, but I'm not actually using it. If I do print fact without parentheses, it will only tell me that this function exists. I'm not actually executing it. To actually execute it, I have to include the brackets, as I've shown you right there. That's, a, that's the key differential, uh, the, the differentiating factor that I want you to notice. To actually run a function, you need brackets around after the function name. So no input, we execute print fact, and it gives us some output. There are indeed 12 months in the year. No, uh, we didn't actually have to pass in anything as an argument, so the brackets were empty. And even if you have no arguments, you still have to mention them. Uh, just one thing that I didn't mention in my notes, um, but in the, I did want to say, you can also have functions that, that take more than one number. So for example, print, so define area of rectangle. And of course, it's not squared. So side one, side two. I can say return side one times side two. So that, um, that obviously does exist. So that now, if I do area of rectangle, three and four, three times four is indeed 12. So it should, um, if I run it, it does indeed result in 12. That's how it can work with more than one uh, argument. You just put a comma in and chuck in as many arguments as you want. That should be self-sufficient. Built-in functions, very nearly to the end. Uh, we've only got one bit left on objects, a couple of uh, bits long. Um, so print function is a built-in function, it exists inside the computer, um, and it can help us display a message on the terminal. But we also have some functions that the Python has written for us. Uh, we use the function keyword, just as you would for any other function, and we use parentheses, and there are some here of your interest to you. Uh, so we have the max function. So if we give it two values, it gives out the value that's bigger. Input, so it allows us to put some data in to the computer by typing in string, converts to a string, con integer, converts anything inside the brackets to a number, float, uh, converts it to a float, and then for the length or how many characters or how many uh, characters have been used or letters. Notice the brackets are imperative. Just to show you that quickly and um, without wasting any of your time. So um, if I want to do the max function, what's the maximum, the highest number between three and 10? Indeed, it's 10. So it just tells him that's 10. I think there's actually, ah, so this is a useless use shortcut. Input, so you input is quite useful. For example, if I want to say uh, user um, input equals input, tell me your name. Um, and then I say, print your name is plus user input. It takes the input from the user and it will print it out. So if I run this, hopefully this works. Tell me your name. My name is indeed Ahmed. I'm inputting it into the computer. And then the print tells me your name is Ahmed and I can change that. Uh, string, um, just for completion. So string, if I provide the number 32, um so my number let's say my number is actually just 32 for a second uh, print um the number is plus my number problem is because i have an integer and i'm trying to force it with a string it will not allow it to be fused together or concatenate so what i have to do is i have to convert my 32 to a string my number is now indeed 32 because I've converted the digits into a string. Uh, and the same obviously works for integer, um, just for completion. So if I try and do, uh, I don't know, five times three, this does work, but it does give you something different to what you expect. It just prints the same string three times. However, if I want to actually do the calculation, int, so it converts to an integer, five times three, it should give me 15. Indeed, it does. Um, float and len all work the same way. Len, um, my name has five letters in it, which tells me that I have five letters in my name. Methods, um, yeah, I mean, there's not much else to it. So you can also use methods on certain uh, entities. In computers, we call them, computer programming, we call them objects because anything can be generalized to an object, as you'll see momentarily. So strings, integers, and lists are all types of objects in the computer. Um, as you'll see momentarily, this is why we will 
create our own blueprint for something um, that's called object oriented programming. They only work with the object they're designed with. So print works with all um, uh, functions. So functions generally work with all types of data, but methods only work with specific types. So for example, upper um, only works with strings. Append only works with lists and values and items only work with dictionaries. So if I take this same one, if I do Ahmed in lowercase dot upper, that turns this into uppercase. Uh, likewise, you might understand that if I try, so control MV, uh, if I do Ahmed dot lower, that just converts into lowercase. Uh, it only works with a string there, so I can't do, for example, three dot lower um, because that's a decimal and it doesn't accept that. So if I just reverse that there, that should be job done. Uh, a list, so if we had groceries again, say I want to extend my list, I'm going to the groceries, I'm, I want to, to add something. So I can do groceries dot append. What else might I want? I might want some chicken tonight. So what I do is I groceries append. See what happens. I've added chicken to the end of the list. Um, sort as well, so sort is quite similar. Um, not in terms of addition, but rather in sorting out everything in alphabetical order. So groceries.sort, even though it's still a method, um, I still have to use brackets. I'm not actually implying anything um, in terms of how I want it to be sorted, so it doesn't in alphabetical order. Groceries sorts it out in alphabetical order, B, C, M, P. Uh, values in dictionaries, so we remember our dictionary, um, which I think was here earlier. Let's get that down, so it's coins. If I want just the values and uh, keys of the, uh, if I want just the uh, values, I can ask for it. Um, so it tells me that the values are Solana and bottom, so I can just, then I have to just list them. I'll convert them to a list. Let's do coins.items as well, um, which again, just does the same thing. Um, just more loosely, but converts it into tuples. Um, no, not all methods, by the way, work the same way depending on how they're written they might have to try different things uh, methods they are useful as i said so in this example which i don't have to describe to you anymore um so this converts the string into uppercase they're called differently because you have to actually have the we have the variable name first and then put a full stop um, we still need the round brackets because it's, it's still a subroutine um even if you have no arguments to pass and doing my string uh, doing, um, let's see. So if I do my name is Ahmed, that's obviously going to save that as a variable. But if I do my name dot upper, that's only actually telling me that the function upper exists. If I actually have to use my round brackets to run it. That's basically what it's saying. It, it returns a subroutine, but does not execute it. Uh, with lists, it's very similar as well, as you just saw. Um, so it reorganizes the list in order. There should be a rounded bracket on the end. That was my mistake. However, it doesn't actually mean that I need to actually add it to a new variable. So unlike in the previous example, um, names.sort sorts it in place. It means that I don't have to assign it to a new variable. Where it actually functions, however, return a new copy of my variable and it leaves the original one untouched. In this case, it has actually changed the original variable uh, entirely. You have to be careful as well. Always remember, you check what you're doing in terms of if you're using a method or a function. Um, dictionaries, uh, same thing as you just saw, um, just gets you the values and you can get, get specific information and they only apply to the object you're calling on. So if I had my dictionary two, it doesn't work on my dictionary two because I've said to it, I only want it to work on my dictionary. Um, and you can use the results of methods. So now that I've got the values, I can then loop through them. So for item in my dictionary dot values, try that now. Um, so it's, so, um, so you saw coins dot values. Um, so for item in list coins dot values, print item. Makes it very simple as to why the for loop exists and why the method works the way it does. So uh, one more thing. So yeah, that's um, yeah we've already done these slides. I remember lambdas are what you'll see next week. But essentially, when we have a function, we have to actually give it a name. Func uh, you can also have functions that don't have a name. They're called lambdas because lambdas and maths are known as anonymous functions, which have their own special um, behaviors. That's why they're called that way. For this example, 
um, if I have a lambda x x squared, that's an anonymous function. It doesn't have a name, but I can assign it to a variable, um, as in this case. And then when I do square of three, it's equal to nine. This doesn't, it's not really a good example in this case, but sometimes in what you'll see next week in data science is that you might have to sort some data and provide it with a function. And rather than writing a new function saying, this is my function equals whatever well, defined, this is my function. And then write that function, you can just actually just say lambda, taking the value of x in and then giving the return, returning this value. The return is implicit. So we always assume that it assumes that we're returning x squared back to the screen. So they avoid the need for naming functions specifically because I haven't actually given it a name. I've just assigned it to a variable, um, but they aren't. This lambda doesn't actually have a name of itself. Um, so you specify a parameter, which in this case is x, and you tell it what to return x to the power of two. Um, so it's return implicitly because we haven't actually said the keyword return. And you can choose to store it as a variable. Imran may be here next week to show you that, um, but use that more to sort data. Now. This is the real crux of this lecture. There's only, uh, say, five more minutes left. But this is where we start by looking at objects. When we look at programming, data types are what we call objects. Um, because that's just a generalization, a high level overview. All objects in programming have attributes and methods. So strings, for example, have the upper and the lower, but dictionaries um, have the values and the items methods and attributes as well. And if we want, we Objects are essentially a blueprint in a sense. We have a blueprint for strings. We have a blueprint for numbers. And so, for example, we can't add strings, but we can add numbers. We can actually have a blueprint for our own types of objects in terms of, for example, if we're creating an app, we want to have a blueprint for a user. The user has a name, the user has an age. And that's what we can do with something called object-oriented programming. So what we first need to do is actually design the blueprint. This is otherwise known as the class. And um, when we define a class or we define a blueprint, it has to be done in a certain order. You can't just uh, muck about and try something completely random. It has to be done in a specific way. The first thing that we do is we use the class keyword. The first thing we ever write is a class keyword. And we define supply, um, let's say supply define, it means just supply, it's a typo, and init function. Init means initialize. So we create our blueprint, which is called, well, in this case, we're creating a blueprint for a human being. And then we say that when this human is created, hence initialized, uh, we're going to give this human a name and we're going to give it an age. Um, so when we create that human, its name, self.name, the human's name itself is given, is the name that we provide it in the parameters and the self.age, the human's age itself is the age that we provide it itself. For an instance of the human class, we're using the class name and we supply two arguments. So how we actually create a human is that we say human one, then we say the class uh, name, which is capital H for human. Normally classes have a capital to start off with, and we say David. So we're going to say David exists and he's 23 years old, so that when we create this human being, he is indeed David with an age of 23. Human two, however, is someone completely different. It's a female this time. It's, uh, her name is Sarah, and she's 33 years old. And when we actually print these, notice that human one and human two are different and we actually get their respective properties. That's how we separate them. We actually refer to them by their, uh, by their variable name, but also in terms of their attributes. And I'll show you that here uh, very briefly, but this is the crux to the higher level computer programming. We're not going to do human. Let's try dogs, for example. Class dog. This is my dog. I'm going to create a dog and I'm going to tell the computer this is how a dog works. Define. And then initialize, so that's underscore twice. I say the dog itself, um, self is a keyword that you always have to supply uh, bec um, because it references the instance of that uh, class, so, i.e. the human one, human two, they're both instances of the human. So, but we always have to have that self keyword. And then we have name and age. Self dot name, then the dog's name, the dog's name itself, is the name that we provide. The dog's age itself is the age that we provide. We run that, that should work. Perfect. When I create my dog or when I uh, create it in its digital form, uh, dog one is going to be equal to dog 
I won't give it a name. I'm going to call it um, Jim, and the dog shall be two years old. See that runs? Tick. So it knows that it exists. Let's give another dog as well. Uh, dog, um, not Sarah. Oh no, Jane. That dog is three years old. Now, that all works very nice and well. However, I want, for example, to ask for the. Let's try. Let's try to see if it doesn't work with print dog. One dot name. I would expect Jim to show up. Yes. Now, why is it that dog two dot name does not give me Jim? It gives me Sarah. The reason is with the self function self. Uh, attribute. It's saying that when I'm so when I'm providing a name, I want that name to be attached to dog one, i.e. to the variable itself. I don't want it to be attached to dog two. So each time I create a new instance of dog or a new new, new type of dog, I make sure that name is only attached to that variable. For example, if I create dog two, dog two dot name refers to just the name for dog two. That's how I separate. That's why there's no clashes, it's because I use that self keyword, and that's very imperative for object oriented programming. It's a very, it will become quite, it's quite new to you, but you will get the hang of this the more you do it. It's a very basic idea as to why, when I, for example, when you sign into Instagram or you sign up to a social media service, when you sign up and you press register on the back end, what happens is they've got, already got a profile for how a user should exist. They have a name, they have an age, they have certain content that they like, and they immediately say that, users, that user, her, him or herself, has this age. That user, him or herself, has this age. That user has this username. So that's how we separate different instances rather than more clashing together. We use the self keyword. And back in the 50s and the 60s when this first began, this is how they solved this problem. They said, if we're going to create a class, we're going to first make sure that self is we have to make sure that the user includes the self keyword so that we can separate different instances. So every time we use this blueprint, different objects are, are derived with their own special credentials. We're nearly there. So um, just to go back, what, the, what does self indeed mean? Self actually refers to the instance in question. So we have human one or human two. They're both different instances of the human blueprint. As I showed you there, um, if you have to think about it, we look at it more diagrammatically. Human one is indeed David. He is 23 years old. Human two is indeed Sarah. She is 33 years old. There are two different instances, as you can see here visually. When I run self.name equals name, I'm specifically creating this human or constructing this human, hence the word, hence the specific name constructor. And I'm specifically saying, create me this human with a name of David and the age of 23. In easier terms, it just means assign the variable itself, hence self, a name attribute, so give it a name, equal to the name that I've just told you to put in, in the argument. Self keyword is much more useful when we have class methods. It's not very useful here, but it will work in a few moments. It helps to customize functions. So now that we're nearly done, thank God, uh, if we want to say mix, create some action, say we have a fun, uh, say we want that method that we saw earlier. I wanted a human to tell me his name or her name. I have to provide the keyword self <clears throat> because that self is going to be very important to say that human itself, that variable itself, I want itself to tell me its name. That's where the word self comes from. So uh, in this case, it would be human one dot greeting. Uh, hello, my name is David. If I did human two dot greeting, it would be hello, my name is Sarah because Sarah herself is telling me her name. Just to show you that here. If I go, I would have to do this um, method uh, declaration in the class because that's where the blueprint is. So I'm going to do define um, greeting and self is important. You always have to give the keyword self every time. I say print. Hello, my name is plus self.name. So when I ask the human for their name, the, the variable itself or the human itself gives me their name. I'm going to have to rerun this because my blueprint is now changed um, in order to make use of this new method. So if I ask human one, uh, dog, one, dog one, rather, not human one, for their, to do me a greeting, remember all subroutines have uh, brackets. It tells me, ooh, uh, Ah, 
I also have to then reconstruct the dog from scratch. So now that has a, and now it's able to greet itself. I just realized that was a slight error on my part. Okay, Jim has now been able, and Jim is now able to talk to me. Likewise, to the way the self helps me to avoid any clashes, doc two dot greeting. Jane is now able to also give me her name because I can separate them by their variable name. I can also separate their greetings respectively. And also notice I can do, uh, ooh, Jesus, I can, um, if I just copy and paste and paste and paste, you can probably guess it's just going to do it four times in a row. That's how the method works. Thank the Lord for that. So you must always include the self keyword whenever you use a method declaration. You, it's the computer actually does it implicitly. It actually fills it in um, but itself, but you have to actually declare it. So when you do human one dot greeting, um, what actually the computer does, it then inserts the word self uh, there. So human one dot greeting self in the, in the back end of the computer. So you don't need to actually include anything in these brackets, but you do need to include it in the class blueprint. Attributes such as name don't require brackets because they're not actually a routine. Um, we're not actually uh, doing anything. We're just printing something out. They're not, there's no function taking place. They're just properties of the object. Every human has a property. Every dog has a property. It's just dog, the dog's name rather. And they're not, ex they're not actually executed, hence we don't need any brackets. Okay, that's nearly the end. So just a few key things for you to uh, look at. And thankfully I finished at eight o'clock. The self keyword is always implicit. When you're using objects, it's given by the computer. So just make sure you include it in the class declaration in the blueprint. With the init uh, function is otherwise known as construction. It gives, it creates an object or it gives birth to one. You can use objects for a wide variety of purposes. I mean, I've just created a human or a dog, but you can do it, for example, to generate a model of a data user. You can use data science, uh, and when, especially when we're doing pandas next week. They're essentially blueprints as well for an object, just like DNA, for example, is a blueprint for human beings because we have the DNA and we can create human beings out of it. Uh, multiple objects that we've created, so human one, human two, dog one, dog two, are just instances of a class. That's just the word we give to it. And specific properties like the name, the age uh, of the human or the dog are just attributes. And with that in mind, that is now eight o'clock. I hope you enjoyed that lecture. Thank you. Where are the details for that? I'm not in the society. Uh, I think if you ask them on the Instagram, on the, on the Instagram um, but if you ask the president, you can just sort it out. Uh, I think it's a sh one thing I should say as well now, now that we're just going to make sure that. Um, yeah, uh, one thing that I would now that I've got the opportunity because now I'm finished bang on time, which was fantastic uh, with a 15 minute delay. Um, so as I was getting, so as um, uh, Kevin Gaines' name, uh, as as the gentleman at the start mentioned, uh, with the projects essentially there are there are going to be a few different projects. You can probably see why this Python course was quite useful because everything that you're going to be doing relates to the Python course. Um, so you're going to be writing a lot of Python, but I wanted you to get an idea as to what the vocabulary was, what we were talking about, and so on and so forth. So giving you a really good grounding makes things a lot quicker for you and for us. Uh, we can still train you again. Um, but you get a really good understanding for Python, not just for, the, for this course or for this uh, project, but also for future for your own benefit. Um, with these projects, um, I mean, I can stand corrected if uh, if I'm mistaken. You, what we mean by equity, um, and I was mentioning this earlier, is essentially we are aiming to create different projects with potent, with actual real life potential. We're not just creating a random project and then and they're storing it away and they're using it. And there, there is commercial aspects to this project. We are actually going to try to release it to the world. The one I know that there's one project that I'm very keen. I don't want to give too much of it away, um, but you'll see it very soon. Um, there is, you know, there are markets where this sort of pro these programs are used and people do pay for this one. The, the, the one I'm talking about, people do pay for it. Obviously, part of our Part of our aim is for you guys to get involved in a bit like a startup fashion. Start to learn how to write code for the real world, real programs. We're going to release them. You're going to write, you're going to put your name on it and say that you created this. And if it, and we have obviously the blockchain being a very good society, there are 
sponsors, there are VCs, there are people willing to fund it. And if it does work, um, you do have equity in them. Um, obviously, we haven't worked out the percentages yet, there's a pizza, but you will get a share of said profits if they do work. And we are serious about this. This isn't like a half assed joke. Um, obviously, we're not talking in the millions, but or in the you know in the very big numbers, but we are saying that there is the potential for it to go very. I mean, the one I've said to Noor and everybody else, the market is very big. You'll you'll see what I mean when I say the market is stupidly big. There's only one person doing it right now, and they're overcharging everyone. And we think we can do it a lot cheaper and have a good cash flow generator. And when you have equity in it, you do get a cut of that um, income as well. So it's quite cool. It hasn't been done before, but I think it's a great opportunity um, to see how it goes. But obviously it starts here. Um, and the intention is we're only recruiting from this course. We're not, unless we need expertise, specialist expertise from DocSoc, we'll hire one or two of them to teach you how to do the engineering parts. But primarily we're going to do this together. It may not work. Don't get me wrong. It may not work. At the end of it, we might, you know, that might not happen. But it's an opportunity for us to try to see if it works. And if it does work, then you know you you're you're in luck. Lastly, the way you can put on a CV, uh, you're interested in fintech technology, which is going to help you. Exactly, and you're also going to be interfacing with um, VCs. We've got some in the network. You're going to be interfacing if you want to go into VC later on. Like, this is a perfect start to say that you've worked in this technology. It's ambitious. I understand. It has a high chance of failure. But it's a risk that I'm willing to put some time into and make it work. I mean, I mean, just for my, I mean, Noah's quite experienced. He's done lots of hackathons. I mean, just for me, for example, I started as a consultant. Then I worked in investment society, took that to number one in the UK, um, and then moved to blockchain. So we have some very good experts. Imran as well, just as well. He, he took in blockchain as well to where it is. And Noor has done lots of hackathons and also leading it right now. We are very well expertise. Things may go wrong. But there's a chance and we want to see whether we can build a junior talent, junior developers, teach you guys what you need to know and really make some fun out of this and make some money along the way. Money is obviously the last objective, but the primary objective is to have fun. The, valuable part is the, building. the building is the main valuable part. The bonus, if it goes all right, is the consistent revenue stream, income stream that you'll benefit out of the equity. But anyway, there's some pizza. Have fun.